right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Edward Williams. Um, I've been working on finding methods to detect and characterize lava tubes on other planets. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And this work was done as part of the geode survey team. Okay. So just for some uh, background on lava tubes in general, if you're not familiar, lava tubes are caves created by lava flows. They form essentially when the lava flow forms a crust of solidified rock over the top of it, and then the interior lava drains out, which leaves a long, uh, sometimes sinuous cave. Lava tubes can be inflated if while they're still active with lava flowing through them, the lava pressure increases, which basically forms forces the roof to deform upwards, sort of like a balloon inflating. Uh, this is a process that will become important in a minute. Um, lava tubes, there are many known examples of lava tubes on Earth, such as on the right here is uh, Valentine Cave in the Lava Bez National Monument. Um, these are also believed to exist on the moon and Mars. We're interested in lava tubes on other planets for scientific and practical reasons. Scientifically, because the protected environment inside of a lava tube could preserve volatiles that wouldn't survive on the surface, and also could have like pristinely preserved rocks. And also for practical reasons, because this protected environment would be able to protect um, astronauts or future habitats from service hazards and uh, temperature extremes. So I'm proposing two methods to study planetary tubes using two different types of surface features. One is using parallel surface cracks and the other inflation bridges. These are sort of the two main prongs in my talk. So I'm introducing them here and I'll go into them more in a lot more detail right now. So uh, for parallel surface cracks, I expect from modeling that I've been doing that a large empty lava tube will, as the roof deforms downwards into the tube, the roof to either sides will deform upwards and be put in tension and cause tensile cracking. Um, I expect these tensile cracks on the surface above the tube are, exist at predictable distances away from the tube, and these predictable distances depend on the uh, width and the roof thickness of the tube. So the way that you can use this to determine information about tubes from the surface is, first of all, to find examples of these parallel cracks near a potential lava tube. These should be visible in satellite imagery, such as in the case of the moon in Elrock imagery. Uh, then to constrain the roof thickness as if possible, such as by looking at the um, perhaps looking at angled imagery of a skylight. And then to use this relationship, which I found to combine the uh, distance from the tube to the cracks with the roof thickness to constrain the tube width. So here's an example of where I, a real location where I've applied this is Dream of Myran. This is a sinuous rill on the lunar surface, um, which ends in what I believe is a Canada tube location as these two aligned depressions and uh, linear cracks like I would expect above a tube running between them. Uh, I measured the distance between these cracks and found that to be 1.3 kilometers, which gives me the distance between the center of the tube and each set of cracks of 0 0.65 kilometers. I estimated the roof thickness as of 80 meters by looking at a similar rill. And by applying the relationship that I found to these, I found an approximate width for this tube of 1.5 kilometers. Uh, so the significance of this is, uh, first of all, seeing the cracks implies the tube is drained, uh, which is important because sometimes a lava tube isn't drained if the lava inside it just plugs where it is. Um, also, this width is within the possible range of expected tube sizes on the moon, which is a promising sign. Um, the width of the tube that I estimated can be used to inform models of internal stability of the tube. And also knowing the width of this tube that I found is similar to the width of the rill itself could inform models of how rills and tubes form and how one can transition into another. <clears throat> the second method that I've been using is looking at inflation ridges. I've been modeling inflation of tubes to find what combination of parameters can produce an observed ridge height. So the ridge height H depends on the parameters that I've been using are the internal lava pressure P, the effective roof thickness, which is the thickness of a viscoelastic layer in the, in the roof when the tube is active that's expected to contribute most of the strength of the roof, and the uh, Young's modulus of the rock. <clears throat> so I've modeled the inflation of these tubes to find how these parameters, to quantify how these parameters depend on each other, and then be able to constrain unknown of these parameters by using constraints on the known ones. Um, this here on the right is an example of, sorry, I'm going to the mic for a second. Uh, the bottom right here is an example of uh, a sinuous tumulus over a lava tube in Kilauea, which shows the sort of inflation ridge that I'm talking about with people walking across it. 
So the way to apply this method to learn about tubes is first of all, to find the uh, inflation ridge height H using topographic data. This can be, for instance, LIDAR data. Then constrain the remaining parameters as closely as is possible. Um, the internal lava pressure can be estimated using pressure head by looking at the elevation difference between the uh, tube and the vent that the lava flowed from to make the tube. The effective roof thickness can be constrained by looking at the maximum roof thickness. The maximum roof thickness can be constrained by looking at what the roof thickness is today. Um, and the Young's modules can be constrained using experimental values. So these are the relationships that I found between these parameters. I found that the uh, ridge height, pressure, and rock strength are all linearly related. So I define a length scale to combine all of them. And that length scale is related by this function to the effective roof thickness. And this uh, function you can see expressed on the right here. Um, and using these relationships, you can apply uh, constraints on any of these parameters to better constrain the others. And I'll show an example of how in a second. Uh, and finally, I apply the cooling relationships of Hahn et al. 1994 to basically translate. These relationships tell you how, for a given thickness of roof, how long it has to, the roof has to be cooling. And this can essentially translate a roof thickness into a cooling time. So you can use the thickness to constrain the age of the roof. So the main example where I've been applying this is Valentine Cave in California. Uh, this here is a LIDAR scan of the surface above Valentine Cave. From the scan, we know that the ridge height is approximately two meters. I constrained the other parameters as well as I could for this tube. Um, I found the maximum for the effective roof thickness was limited by the full roof thickness that we see in the present, which is one meter. Um, I found the experimental, the experimental range for the Young's modulus that I used was between 0 0.5 and 20 gigapascals, which is quite a large range, but this is when the roof rock is still young and viscoelastic and still soft. And then uh, I estimated the pressure head to be 7.1 megapascals. Okay, so uh, from these, I combined these values and used the constraints that I had on some of them to constrain the others. You can see here on the right, this green area is the range of uh, possible conditions that I found. Um, so I found the minimum Young's modulus possible for this tube to be 2.34 gigapascals and the maximum effective roof thickness to be 0.42 meters. And then applying the cooling relationships, this maximum effective roof thickness translated into a uh, roof age of approximately 165 hours. So that tells us that inflation of this particular tube must have happened within the first 150 hours or so after the roof began forming. Why this is significant is, uh, first of all, Determining the roof ages can give us a timeline of inflation, and this could be applied to tube systems to tell how they developed. For instance, you could determine if inflation occurred in a tube system in all one pulse or, uh, thank you, or several different pulses over time. Um, <clears throat> also, by looking at the roof ages in different locations, you can tell where the roof is older and younger, and this could give insights into how the tube roof formed and where roof formation began. And also determining the uh, current roof thickness um, without needing to rely on skylights or holes into the tube could be useful for planetary tube applications. So just a few places where I'm planning to apply these methods. Uh, first of all, to the Tharsis region on Mars. This is where some inflation ridges have already been detected, which are believed to be possibly above lava tubes. So I'll be very interested to apply these methods here. Also, I'll be going back to the Lava Beds National Monument in California, which is where Valentine Cave is, to apply to some more tubes there. I'm going to have some upcoming aerial LIDAR data of that area, which I should be able to apply this to. Um, so essentially using the inflation ridge method in these locations, I should be able to characterize something about how the tubes inflated and how they formed. And using the parallel cracks method, I will be able to constrain their dimensions and whether or not they are drained. Right, and this is just, so to summarize, I found two new methods to characterize uh, lava tubes from surface features, which can give different each one can give different outputs, and I'm planning to apply these to um, several different locations where tubes are present. And these are just some images from our geodes field work that we did out in Lapa's National Monument. Okay, thank you. <laughs>